So welcome to lecture six of business technology and innovation. Uh, today we're talking about structure and culture, like I said, uh, hopefully uh, this uh, lecture will be a bit shorter than the uh, packed lectures we had uh, the uh, weeks before. Um, so last week we talked about an organization strategy. So this is um, um, the part of the uh, course where we talk about an organization and its characteristics and the role with technology. So last week we talked about organization and, str and strategy. So we talked about what an organization is, the mission and vision and strategy of an organization. And we discussed a, a bunch of strategic tools with which you can analyze your organization uh, and your organization strategy. And a couple of which you also need for the business plan. Uh, this week we're gonna discuss the uh, internal workings of an organization. So how can we classify an organization structure and culture? click. So what we'll do, we'll uh, first shortly discuss uh, Board's value chain, a way of classifying an organization. And then we will discuss the basic structure dimensions, so the dimensions that you can use to structure, uh, to identify the basic structure of an organization. Um, then uh, we will discuss an organization culture. So what is a culture exactly? And we discuss, I think, a very useful typology of culture in an organization. So let's start with the value chain. Um, so if you, well, no, let's first talk about structure. Um, so what is an organization structure? Well, an organization structure is simply how you can define an organization um, in terms of well, structure. So you have a difficult definition given by Minsberg. Minsberg is, um, I think, by far the most important uh, person um, uh, scientist who has studied the structure of an organization uh, who came up with a lot of theorizing on how organizations actually are, are structured, how you can classify them. And he defines an organization structure as follows. The structure of an organization can be defined as simply as the sum of total, some total of the ways in which his labor is divided into distinct tasks and then its coordination is achieved among these tasks. So basically, how do you define labor into distinctive tasks and then how you coordinate those tasks. So if you think of a very old fashioned organization, uh, you know, a factory based work and everyone does his or her job and every, has a, every person has a specific job in the uh, factory line. And, and the work between us people has to be coordinated um, with the uh, factory line, so it goes from one person who does something automatically to the next person, and then that's how you achieve all the coordination. It's a very simple way of uh, classifying an organization structure. So that's one definition. Another definition is even more simple, and that is what an organization looks like in terms of departments, group size, functions, coordination, etc. Um, so it basically means how to classify an organization in turn. Um, the first one, uh, the first theory, well, theory model is the value chain. And you may remember this from last uh, week when we talked about an organization strategy, then, that this was also part of the strategic tools with which you can analyze um, the strategy of your organization. Or more specifically, this is a tool to which you can, with which you can analyze if your organization is suitable for the proposed strategy. So if you have a certain strategy for the coming years, what do you need in your organization? How do you need to adapt your organization in order to make sure, sure this can happen? This basic value chain is, I think, from the 50s or 60s or so, also by Porter. Um, and it shows. Um, discuss more about that in the next slide, but let me first shortly explain what this value chain entails. So basically, the value chain it uh, describes the basic process of an organization, from inbound logistics all the way to service. Um, on top of that, are well, actually they should have been below that, but on top of that, as it is always drawn, are the um, other things you need as an organization. So the um, basic functionalities of an organization to make sure that you can do the primary process of an organization. 
So the primary process of an organization consists of inbound logistics, everything you need to get your raw materials uh, here and to organize it. And also, you know, buying, etc. Then you have your operations. That is where actually the work happens, you know, where you um, assemble the raw materials into uh, something concrete. Then you have the unbound logistics, you know, transport, and storage, etc. You have marketing and sales to make sure that your products are actually sold, but the services are delivered. And then you have after sales service. Um, so, that, uh, you know, your after sales service has customer feedback, etc. Um, uh, and service uh, for when your product breaks down, those kind of things. So those, that, that is your basic process of the organization. But to make sure that happens, you need some kind of, so you need some basic factors in your organization. So first of all, you need to have the infrastructure in place, which means you need to have, um, well, you need to have the buildings uh, yeah, to, uh, where your people can work. There needs to be kind of a management team, a management structure. Uh, finance is also located here, just to make sure that everything that you are able to do everything. Um, you need human resources, so you need to know who works in your organization, uh, how to pay them, and uh, who is when on leave, how they are doing, um, administering uh, sick leave, etc. Those kinds of things. So human resources. You need technology. You need information technology to make sure that people can communicate with each other and that you can communicate between the different processes of your organization. Uh, and you basically need a bunch of other technology as well uh, if you make a physical product. Um, and there is procurement, which basically means that you have to have the raw materials in stock in order to make sure that you can produce uh, the thing you make. So this is called the value chain because it, it's, it's a chain in your organization that creates value. So you can imagine that uh, everything you need in, to come in your organization, raw materials as a certain price, uh, then on top of that comes the whole, uh, your whole organization. Um, and after the product leaves your organization, now uh, you have added value. So um, the product you make is more than the sum of the raw materials and everything you add in in between, because it also contains, you know, revenue or profit budget. So that's the value change. You basically add value throughout the chain. Raw materials come in, let's say iron com comes in, a car comes out, the car is more valuable than the raw materials because of the value you add in the organization. And um, so this is a very basic way of analyzing an organization. Uh, but it is still useful in current day organization. So a, the major drawback of this value chain is that it mostly applies to organizations who actually make physical stuff. You know, where you do actually have raw materials coming in, when you do have something that happens and when you then sell something, you know, I'll think of a basic factory that makes a product. Um, it applies less well to organizations that provide services. And it provide and it caters even less to organizations that are that really have advanced business models like platforms, etc. Because they, you know, they, they don't may not even have like an inbound logistics or their, their inbound logistics is intrinsically tied to who their customers are. So this value chain may not apply uh, to every type of organization, and may or may not fully apply to every type of organization, but it's still pretty useful. Um, because you can use it to analyze how strong or weak and what opportunities threats you have uh, for each component, um, especially um, concerning your organization strategy. So, for example, if you as an or your strategy as an organization is to in the coming years to be able to produce uh, your product cheaper than before, then you can do a SWOT analysis um, for the entire value chain. So, okay, what do we need to do if we want to offer our product cheaper? Um, how strong we see the components? What can we do in our operations? Um, do we have uh, leeway? Do we have flexibility to, uh, to, to in, in increase the, the time or don't decrease the time that a product needs to be uh, manufactured, um, oh, et cetera? Um, you can think of inbound logistics, you know, can we have a um, 
so do we need to have everything in stock or can we have like a just-in-time delivery uh, so that we have to keep less in our warehouses which is cheaper so if you have a certain strategy you can go through the value chain and you can use this value chain analysis to see okay what are we good at what are we less good at uh, what do we need to change in order to retain our strategy um and you can uh, so you can do that for your organization strategy. You can also, in general, more in general, but also still, of course, tied to your strategy, see how well you are doing in terms of competitiveness to the uh, to other organizations. So um, for each of the resources, you can check if your resources are rare, valuable, dur durable, and uh, inimitable. So uh, cannot be copied by other organizations. So for example, um, um, your uh, service organization, um, is this something you do better than other organizations? You know, is it rare? Is it something you, you have, do you provide exceptional service that other problems that your competitors don't? Um, are your competitors able to imitate you on your service level? Um, is your service level durable? So is it, is it very expensive to, uh, to maintain? Um, or, or is it something that, that is, you know, that, that really adds value to your company, um, which is also valuable. So for each of these, you can you can check. Okay, is this how do I basically how well do I do on this aspect uh, with the, in the, with regard to my competitors? And that may also allow you to analyze okay, how well you are doing or what you what you need to change in your organization. So this is a pretty useful but very basic tool to analyze the internal workings of an organization. Um, and well, like I said, the main drawbacks of this tool is that they um, mostly apply to, to organizations who make products uh, and less to organizations who provide services or allow more a kind of process or platform organization. Um, Another drawback is that there is relatively little attention to human capital. So human resources is there, but especially if you're an organization in which human capital is very important, you know, you, you want so, so that you, for example, provide a service for which you really don't actually make a product, but rely on the knowledge of the people who work in your organization. I would say uh, when you, uh, an organization makes video games, uh, uh, consultants, uh, marketing organizations, they um, they really rely on human capital and, and not on not on operations and, and, and raw materials and there is relatively little attention for that in this uh, model. Okay, that's one. I think this one is pretty self-explanatory. Okay, let's. Uh, tested resources. Ah, yeah, good question. No, sorry. Um, tested resources. Um, uh, tested means uh, silent. Um, and in knowledge management, uh, we talk about tested knowledge, and that is knowledge that is not explicitly written down somewhere. So, for example, if you need to operate a machine, you get a manual, you can read through the manual, and you know how to operate the machine. So, that's explicit. Um, tacit knowledge would mean that um, you talk to someone who has worked in the organization for years and who say, well, the machine sometimes uh, goes down, but then, you know, you have to just unplug it and plug it in and then kick it in this place and then it works again. Um, that is something that is not in the manual, but that only resides in people's minds. And that is what we call tacit knowledge. Um, but well, there are lots of tacit resources. So especially in organizations who work with knowledge, so organizations who do not make physical products, like the examples I gave, you know, uh, like the work I do um, and when you are a programmer, etc. Uh, a, a lot of the resources in the organization are in, in people's minds. And that is what we call tacit. Um, and as you see, there is nothing about knowledge um, in this in this model, so there's nothing about okay, how can we best use and retain the knowledge that people have in the organization, and those are tested resources, and the model does not um, accommodate that. Uh, that. Thanks for pointing it out. I didn't explain that. Okay. Then we move on to the. Um, 
structure dimensions of organizations. And simply put, there are basically three main dimensions that you can use to classify the structure of an organization. Uh, they are called departmentalization, centralization and span of control, and formalization and standardization. Then, well, let's discuss uh, all three of them that are here. So departmentalization means, well, departmentalization means how you, well, how, how you divide up your organization. So basically, um, departmentalization can be functional. So, um, and an organization is split up in a way that different um, departments or parts of the organization do different things. Um, or an organization can be more like divisional, that you have separate divisions, um, uh, which are, for example, um, um, locally oriented. And oftentimes it's mixed. So completely unclear, but let me give a clear example. So this is a, the, the top is a functional division of an organization. So if you create an organization chart, this is an organization chart, then you can, um, create the organization uh, chart in a couple of ways, depending on how the organization is basically structured. So an organization can be structured functionally. So within the organization, we have a marketing department, we have a production department where the work happens, we have human resources, we have customer service, we have an IT department, we have finance, and maybe there are a lot more. So an organization is structured according to function. So for example, in our organization, we have uh, the people who do the uh, core jobs and we teach and do research, and we are the uh, scientific staff. Um, then we have the support staff, and the support staff is defined into uh, IT, marketing, um, human resources, finance, and a couple of others. So we have a so that's the functional division within our organization. The other type of division is um, of departmentalization is a divisional structure. Now, this is when you split your organization up into separate divisions uh, based on whatever uh, dimensions, um, and then have separate units for each of these divisions. So, for example, an organization could be so um, it could be divided into uh, different um, products that the company makes. So, for example, if you're a medical um, company, you can make medical devices, you can make consumer products, baby care, diabetic drugs, nutritional supplements, example, so, so those can be the divisions of your organization. You know, Philips, for example, Philips has Philips Medical, uh, Philips Consumer, and from others that I don't know of. Um, but you can also be divided into geographic regions. So for example, you can have a, you, you can have a, a um, a, a European, an Asian, an, a, an American or Northern South American uh, division of your organization. Um, or even more fine grained, you know, you can have an, a, a, a Tilburg or an Amsterdam division. Um, but it all means that, that the departmentalization of your organization is not based on the function of the people, but based on the division uh, in in geography or type of products or services. Um, so of course, these are very simple examples of a, uh, of a structure. Um, so there is, so here you have a CEO with different functions below, uh, below it. So usually it's much, it's much more, um, uh, so it's much more hierarchical. So you have a CEO, and between the CEO, you have like uh, general managers, and then you may have a functional division, then you have a, a C head of marketing uh, with uh, everyone in marketing below it. Um, and even marketing may be subdivided into, you know, regular marketing, social media marketing, after sales service, um, etc. So it may be, so, Oftentimes, a organization chart is more complicated than these simple examples here. Um, and what you often see is that um, uh, that you have a 
that you have a mixed structure in your organization. So departmentalization in most organizations is both functional and um, divisional. I think we have an example here. Um, so for example, in our organization, you see that you have a, uh, so, so that well, you have the board of university directly below the board, you have the uh, faculties of the university. So we have five faculties. We are the faculty of uh, social uh, humanities and uh, data science. Um, we have uh, social science, uh, we have law, we have economics and forget one. Um, so this is the main functional division of our university uh, along those five different faculties. Um, so those are below the board of the university. And then, um, uh, but then we have also a functional division. Some of the functional division is university wide. So we have uh, one central uh, finance department. We have a central IT department, um, but there are also functional departments within um, within each faculty. So each faculty has uh, its own human resources, for example. So you see that it's mixed. So our university, as our most large organizations, are a mix between functional and divisional structure. Um, so what you also see in modern day organizations is that modern day organizations are more um, structured along matrix lines. So you have both a functional and a divisional. So for example, you as an employee work for, um, in, so, so say you are a, a social media uh, expert in your organization, um, you are problem. So you belong to the functional division of marketing. Uh, but you're a member of probably more than one uh, a, a divisional team uh, that, so for example, a part of your time you work for product one, another part of your time you work for product two, but within that product you are the social and media expert and you work together with, for example, developers, uh, with a, a other marketing managers, with uh, someone from IT, and together you are a team for a certain product, but you are still also part of the marketing, uh, uh, the marketing division. Um, so that's a matrix division of the organization. So basically these two divisions, so functional and divisional is like archetypes. So the, the most simple uh, clean types of division of the organization, but oftentimes there's really, really an integration of different uh, um, and departmentalization uh, structure in the organization. So what you nowadays see, um, you see that organizations nowadays talk about, you know, agile development um, and, and those kinds of scrum type of uh, um, uh, ways of organizing that you hear um, and planning. And, um, D these usually mean that people work together in, in very small teams who are um, uh, very autonomous, uh, who do their own projects and have their own responsibilities, um, and that they work together. You, know, you have different people who work together on a single project manager. So like you see here, there's an enterprise coordinator, like a project manager, and then you have several uh, business units or you know, smaller organizations, even more. Um, um, those, those, those can be even specific people. So you have a manager and then you have someone who works for, you know, sales, someone who works for marketing and, and who work on a separate task in a, in a very small and functional team. When, once they're done, the team dissolves and you become part of another team on a different task. Um, So, so that's, so remember, we are, we are still talking here about departmentalization. So these are different ways of, um, uh, of classifying you know, the basic structure of the organization, departmentalization, which departments or functions. 
you may define your, your organization into. Um, the second main dimension of organization structure is centralized versus decentralized decision making. So some organizations are very centralized, while others are more decentralized. Um, it's, yeah, um, it's not complicated at all. Centralized means that um, most decision making happens at the top and then it trickles down into the rest of the organization. Think people who are in the army. You know, there is a general and he communicates to the major and the lieutenant and the sergeant, etc. cetera, um, uh, right up to, up to the soldier. Um, and so decision making is very central and coordinated. Um, bottom up decision making, so decentralized decision making, means that people um, at the bottom of the organization have a high degree of autonomy in making, in, in structuring their own work. Um, so well, basically think my work, I am a teacher and a scientist. Someone tells me, um, you know, Alex, um, uh, you do research into um, uh, the social aspects of community communication. Uh, maybe you should teach a course which has to do with technology and uh, organizations. And then I have the almost complete freedom to tailor the course uh, the, and, uh, the way I want. So decision making is very bottom up. You know, I, I get very broad guidelines of what I am supposed to do. You have to do some research, some teaching, but how I do my work um, is um, is very much up to me. So decision making is very bottom up in my case. Um, so that's central versus local uh, or top versus bottom up decision making. Um, that also relates to the span of control of an organization. So some organizations have a really high uh, span of control. They are a very tall structure. Uh, so I think of a, a large tree or a telephone pole like you see here, like a CEO, you have a general manager, you have a manager, you have a supervisor, you have an employee. You can have a lot and lots of layers uh, in the organization. Um, while well, other organizations have more of a flat structure. So you have a CEO, a manager, and maybe a sub-manager, and that's it. So it takes only a few steps before you, um, um, before you are at the top. And what works best really kind of depends on the organization. You know, if you have a really strict organization, if you, make a, if you make a fixed product, you have to make sure that everyone does their job and there's not much freedom, then a centralized decision making will probably work best. Also, if you work with well, classified information or difficult IT or privacy and security things, then centralization is basically probably best. Um, if you are a very flexible organization, you need to be innovative, um, or if your employees are really professionals and very autonomous, then a flat structure and bottom-up um, way of decision-making works best. Um, there is a picture of our R&D here. I'm going to come back to that in a couple of slides. So that's the second way of classifying organizations. The third way is formalization and standardization. Um, and that means how well is the job defined? Um, and it's, um, um, formalization and standardization is also oftentimes called control versus coordination. So control means that it's really kind of determined what every employee should do. Um, and coordination means that, that you have flexibility in how to do your work. Um, Again, this also relates a bit to the previous dimension, to the previous dimension, uh, but it's also a bit different. So you can still have a, a decentralized organization, but you can still have a high degree of formalization. Um, and uh, well, let me explain first what it is, and then give us a couple of examples. So formalization means that there are explicit procedures, rules, policies, and basically ways to structure work. Um, standardization means there's uniformity of activities. Everyone should do the work exactly the same as everyone else. Um, so in the extreme case, there is total control over how you should do the work. In the less 
my least extreme case, you have total freedom over how to do your work. Um, so think Apple geniuses. So if you work in an Apple store and you have to, and, and you work in customer service, um, the organization may be fairly, um, you know, fairly decentralized and fairly flat, but it's very, very, very formalized. So there are manuals online um, you can, that you can find online of how Apple uh, Genius should behave. And it's very, very structured. So for every possible situation, there is a standard way of answering uh, the questions or the issues. And they should keep that central way. And they should not fear off from um, what they have learned in all the manuals. So it's, it's very controlled how they should do the work. So that is formalization. So of course, coordination means, okay, okay, I want you to, for example, develop a marketing plan for this company. We need it in two weeks, but how you approach it, that is up to you. So you have to co coordinate with your uh, fellow project uh, team, uh, team members, um, and you can see how you want to do it, but we need a marketing plan in two weeks. So that is a very low degree of formalization. And again, one is not better than the other. So for example, if you, if, if you have an organization that actually makes a physical product, you want to have a fairly high degree of formalization because you want to make sure that every product turns out the same. You, know, you want to have high quality control. So therefore you probably need some formalization. Um, so these three dimensions, the partnerization, centralization, the span of control, and formalization, standardization are the three um, dimensions to classify an organization structure. If you look at the basic archetypes of organizations that you have, there are like two archetypes of organization. So two extremes, two extreme types of organizations. Um, one, is one that is really functional and um, highly centralized and formal. And that is what we call a machine bureaucracy. So it has a mechanistic structure. And that is one, an organization which is really all about control. The other type is called a professional organization or organic, an organization with an organic structure. Those organizations are really all about coordination. So they're flexible, flat, informal, decentralized. Um, so let me, uh, well, let's just first ask a couple of questions. So um, if you think machine bureaucracy versus professionalism, what would a call center be? Would that be a machine bureaucracy or a professional organization. Machine, machine, question mark, machine, machine. Yeah. So it's a machine bureaucracy. Can anyone explain why? And can anyone explain why you want a call center to be a machine bureaucracy? You can also turn on the audio and, and say it. You can also type it. Yeah, everyone has the same guidelines to help the customers. There is a hierarchy. Everyone should have the same answers to the customer problems they encounter. Call centers should give them the same information. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, of course, there's a difference between different types of call centers. So some call centers are very uh, basic and some are more complicated. I um, have worked for a while at the uh, call center of uh, Hewlett Packard, a uh, European call center of Hewlett Packard, and as a uh, consultant to improve the organization. Um, and um, in that organization, they had um, you know, different types of call center. So you had first line support. That was the people calling relatively simple problems. My printer is not working, those kinds of questions. So that was very, very formalized. 
Um, then you had the second line call center. That were the people who helped people that could not be helped in the first line. So those were more likely the professional customers with complicated issues. And those were and and um, those people were very much more organically organized because they were the experts. The problems they encountered were very varied, uh, and it was very uh, it was much more difficult to control that. So it depends on the type. Of, uh, depends on the type of call center, but basically main call centers, especially call centers which, with a commercial goal, um, are mechanistic. Yeah. Uh, social media marketing agency? Would a social media marketing agency be con me mechanistic or uh, organic? Organic. And of course, the question is why? So if you think organic, tell me why. Why tell me why? Yeah. Each problem needs a different approach. Sounds, uh, sounds logical. Um, but again, it also depends on where exactly in the team you work. So um, you have those digital advertising agencies. Um, there you have, of course, people who work um, at a more strategic level, and there indeed every problem you get from a customer needs a different approach. Um, you also have people who work more lower in your organization, who work, um, for example, in uh, search engine optimization or search engine advertising. It's still pretty much organic, but it's much more controlled. So there is a much more standard, standard way of approaching it. So you need to do a search for keywords. Um, you need to include the keywords. Uh, you need to uh, uh, think of the meta tags that you um, um, I want to include in the website. Well, um, you need to uh, know how much to bid on an advertisement, well, et cetera. So those kinds of things are much more controlled. Um, and in those digital marketing agencies, you see that um, depending on where you are, there can be a different structure. Um, and there we basically get to these two different pictures. Um, so if you think of McDonald's, you would say that is a machine bureaucracy. And probably some of you have worked at McDonald's and well, you know how it works. Everything is really, really, really mechanistic. So I heard from my niece who works at, uh, a lot younger than I and who works, um, uh, I worked for McDonald's in the past couple of years. That you know, if you fried fries, there is even a standard amount of salt. That you press a button, and there is a standard amount of salt that is distributed across the fries. Um, so, pretty mechanistic. So, if someone has other examples of how mechanistic it is when you work at the McDonald's, please share them in the chat. So, it's fun to hear. Um, but you can also imagine if you for work for McDonald's headquarters and you have to think about the um, strategy of McDonald's in the coming years, you know, for example, in the Netherlands in, a, uh, in a 10 days or so, um, we are getting a, um, a um, every McDonald's response is getting a um, vegan or a vegetarian hamburger, so a Beyond Meat, meat burger. Um, that has to be decided somewhere in the organization. And probably the people who think about that strategy of McDonald's, they are probably work in a more professional organization structure. So it depends on the division that you're in in the organization, uh, what type of structure you have. So if we go back to a figure like this, it could well be that within baby care, the structure is more mechanistic, while in medical devices, the structure is more uh, professional. <laughs> McDonald's and only made for Yeah, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I also have to cook today. So when I'm done at 6.30, I immediately have to stop and cook and then eat. Uh, or else my girlfriend gets angry. Um, Oh, ah, yeah, and also this figure. Um, so uh, this is an example of where an R&D department is, is located in your organization. So an R&D department can be located within 
the central organization, but also within the different departments. But more interesting, I think, is that um, whatever type of organization you have, probably the R&D department is bottom up and is um, uh, coordination instead of control. Uh, because that's probably the way you are most likely able to innovate. So within larger organizations, basically you see the different divisions and different structures of different types of organizing. But basically, if you want to analyze an organization or analyze part of the organization, these are the two archetypes of the structure. Um, yeah, I think I already said this. So um, if you think of innovation in your organization, um, you can, if you are a larger organization, you can um, imagine that you're often less flexible because the larger you get, the more divisions you need, the more hierarchical you will become. So the more layers you have in your organization um, and it becomes much more difficult to communicate something from one end of the organization to the other end of the organization. So you can imagine that someone in one division has an ID that first he has to go up the hierarchy, so he has to tell his manager, he has to tell his manager, and he has to tell the general manager, and then it has to like trickle down again uh, um, into another division that, that makes it really, really, really slow. Um, so therefore, oftentimes you see that um, that larger organizations tend to, you know, either specifically create an R and D department for the most important divisions, or they um, integrate all of R and D and set it apart from the rest of the organization. Of course, while working with the rest of the organization in a more organistic structure, so that you have a single R and D department for the whole organization and not people separately in different departments. Um, so that's what they do. Uh, they may also, uh, you know, uh, isolate several R&D departments, um, you know, so like put, put several R&D departments from, from different parts of the organization together to negate groupthink. That means that, um, so, you know, if you work for a division in an organization, you tend to think in terms of that division. So you tend to think only of, okay, what are we doing? And you tend not to think of what others are doing. So you tend to think in terms of your own group or division. So therefore often you also see that organizations are mixed around uh, R&D departments in order to, to keep people you know, uh, flexible. Um, and that's what we call dynamic tension. Um, so you shuffle people around in the organization in order to keep them uh, innovative. Um, uh, IBM has been doing that for years. So in IBM, you work for a in a certain project team. So after a couple of years, they ask you to uh, work for another team, sometimes even in a different country, um, in order to keep you up your toes. Up your you know, in order to uh, to keep you flexible, in order to keep you creative. Um, so that's why uh, employees of uh, uh, IBM uh, have, have since long called IBM. Uh, I've been moved instead of uh, international business machines. Uh, so that's a small part about innovation in large organizations. So exactly 5.30, uh, I suggest we go on a break for 10 minutes. So let's start at 5.40, 5.40 again, and then we talk about organization culture. So, okay, I'll, uh, thank you, and I'll see you in a bit. So let's continue uh, with the second part of the lecture, which is about culture of the organization. Um, so structure and culture of the organization are, of course, oh, sorry, I need to go to close the door. Structure and culture of the organization of an organization are, of course, tied to each other. So um, an organization with a specific type of structure will also have a specific type of culture probably, which are related. Um, but still there's a difference between structure and culture, of course. You know, like structure, you can uh, explain in terms of well, the three dimensions we discussed before the break, 
you can classify structure and what is better control and deficiency, etc. But you cannot do so easily with culture because culture is more like the informal aspects of an organization. So basically everything that you cannot re really classify um, with the structure of an organization may belong to the culture of an organization. That's still a pretty broad definition. So a better definition of culture is, uh, well, the following three. Now we have one by Shine, which I think is pretty useful. So it says that culture is the deeper level of basic assumptions that are shared by members of an organization that operate unconsciously and define in a basic taken for granted fashion an organization view of itself, its environment. Uh, Hofstede, uh, what, you know, the, I think Hofstede is the most cited um, scientist of the Netherlands uh, of all times, um, because he developed a cultural psychology with, with which you can classify a national culture, but which is also very much used for organization culture. And he calls it uh, the collective program of the mind, which distinguishes the members of one organization from another. And from these dimensions, you can um, uh, you can kind of see what I mean with culture. So you can see that it that it is it is part of an organization. It is shared by everyone in the organization, but it is um, everyone takes it for granted in the organization. But it is not um, uh, formal. It's, it's it's not easily written down. So it resides in people's minds. So like Shine says, operates unconsciously um, and defined in a basic table for granted fashion. And Hofstede calls it collective programming of the mind. Um, so a bit more of a formal definition of culture, well, a formal definition, a bit more of a, a, a definition of culture that, that relates to concrete aspects of culture is uh, the bottom one, um, which says culture is what an organization is besides its structure and formal definition. And it consists of the consists of the shared mental model that members of the organization have in terms of values, beliefs, norms, practices, and artifacts. So again, you see the shared mental model, so that it resides in people's minds. So we shared idea of what the organization is, but we define it in terms of values, beliefs, norms, practices, and artifacts. Um, more about what values, beliefs, norms, etc. are in a moment. But first. Why is it important? Well, culture is important because um, culture makes people work for your organization. Um, so culture is a way of tying people to your organization um, and a way of having people know what they're supposed to do in an organization. Um, sounds a bit weird, but I explain. I can explain it with this slide. So, as an organization, you want you make what you want is to have your employees do what you want them to do in an organization. So, if they work in the factory. You want to do them to work at the production line and do their specific task. Um, but there are several ways of getting people to do that of getting people so far as to do their work. Um, so one of those control mechanisms, as we call it, is market-based, which basically means that you pay people to do their work. Um, if, your organ if your main control mechanism of your organization is market-based, that basically means that you um, employ people based on supply and demand. So think Orstenel and Uber. So it's entirely market-based. People don't work for Uber. Well, they mostly work for Uber, not because they feel attached to Uber, but mainly because, okay, there is some work, I can do it, I can get paid for the exact amount of work I do. So basically, you have people do their work uh, because you pay them for a specific amount of work. So that's one control mechanism. Another control mechanism is bureaucracy. So based on the hierarchy, on formal coordination, so that's the structure of an organization. Okay, you have a structure, you have people working on the organization, and in definition of the organization structure, it is defined what everyone should do. Um, so basically bureaucracy, uh, formal coordination, formal structure is a way of telling people and getting 
what to do and getting them to do it. Um, and finally, you have a clan-based control strategy. So that is getting people so far as to do the work because they really like doing the work for you. Um, so they do the work because they believe in the organization and they believe in the work. And that is what we call culture. And that is why culture is important. Um, of course, we rely on uh, organizations rely on all these three control mechanisms. So we pay people, we have a certain formal structure in place, and we have an organization culture. So in every organization, all these three aspects are present, uh, but it depends on the type of organization um, uh, on which the focus lies. So, for example, in an organization where it's very easy to leave, in an organization which is very or, uh, uh, which is very professionally organ or, uh, organized or structured and organic structure, you really want to rely more on a on a culture that you want to really commit people to you um, instead of only payment. Uh, so that's why culture is important. So when the environment is uncertain, uncertain when, when work is equiv equivocal, which means difficult, um, you see that organizations pay more attention to organization culture. Um, but it's not the only reason. It's also, for example, when the work is really boring, you also see that people, that organizations pay more attention to culture. There is a reason that, or, that McDonald's pays a lot of attention to being part of the McDonald's team. So, to, to, so because paying for such a job is not enough to make you happy, um, you need to also feel kind of part of McDonald's. So it gives you a sense of identification, a sense of autonomy to feel part of the organization. So that's why culture is important. So what, what is it? So this is the definition of our culture. Some kind of shared mental model. Um, but you can basically classify culture of consisting of um, beliefs and values and practices, norms and artifacts. So those beliefs and values are really things you learn unconsciously. So those are the, yeah, the, the core assumptions and values of an organization. Um, so for example, uh, we have equal opportunities. Uh, we feel part of our team. Uh, we believe that we should provide the best product for everyone. Um, those are really the basic values of an organization. So last week when we discussed the mission and vision of an organization, there were some examples of organization culture, you know, uh, a strong focus on MPG development, things like that. Um, those are just words, but in an organization culture, people may actually start to believe that. So I believe in values that you think that the organization is in, in, in terms of like norms, etc., and what it stands for. Um, and you learn that unconsciously. So you learn that unconsciously from information was, you receive about your organization, from your colleagues, from the, um, the corporate image of the organization, um, etc. So for example, Ben & Jerry's uh, is, is, a, is now part of Unilever, but it's really autonomous and it's really a, it's, it's an organization that is really um, strong about, you know, environmental and political um, um, uh, statement. So you know, it's, it's uh, now as a um, uh, as an issue with Unilever because they said something about um, because they don't want to do business do business with certain parts of uh, uh, um, Israel or parts that Israel occupies. Um, and, and we we know that. So basically, everyone who knows Ben and Jerry's knows that that is what is Ben and Jerry's. So we learn that unconsciously. Um, but we also learn about the organization culture because of the practices, norms, and artifacts, so the way we do things. And those are parts of the organization culture that you can actually basically kind of make explicit. Um, so again, when I worked for Hewlett Packard, we had a two-day training in which we learned what was called the HP way. So, and that was so we received a booklet, we received training, we, uh, we had we had informal activities, which all made were made to make us aware of what the culture 
of the little packet was. Um, so they, um, an artifact can, uh, for example, I, I received a, a booklet um, when I worked at Hewlett Packard and the booklet was called the Hewlett Packard Way. And on the booklet was a picture of the two people who found Hewlett Packard in front of their garage, where they found the Hewlett Packard, which was not entirely true, but okay. Um, so that booklet was an artifact. So it was something physical, um, which represented the organization culture. So think flags, think paintings in the, um, in the building of the organization. Think pictures, think um, when you have those uh, fancy pool marketing agencies, think um, a pool table, which kind of says, oh, look at how cool we are. Um, think a, you know, they have like swings in the organization or gardens or whatever cool stuff they do. That's, those are all artifacts meant to display the culture of an organization. Um, which I think is you know, uh, kind of uh, obvious, uh, but a good way of doing it. So thanks for asking, uh, Andy, because I had to explain that. So that's an artifact. Um, and with those artifacts, um, you, can, you can communicate the culture of your organization to your employees, but also, of course, uh, it's tied to your um, corporate image. So also important for your customers. Yeah, so an organization structure needs to fit with your internal structure. So if you have a really mechanistic organization, you cannot have an organizational culture that says, well, how we value individual freedom and everyone should have, to, um, and every employee should be uh, able to, um, um, to develop themselves to the fullest, because that doesn't really match with the structure of an organization. And so an organization culture needs to fit with the structure, uh, but it also needs to fit with the external environment. So if you're a bank, um, and especially when you work with financial products, which require a high degree of secrecy and security, you cannot say, well, it's very important that we have an open culture. So your products are so important that you need to have a culture of formality. Um, to make sure that you and your customers understand you're a very formal organization and that you do your work well. So you cannot have a really open, cool um, organization. That's also the reason why people who work in banks also always wear suits, while people who work for a very hip marketing agency never wear suits. It's because they want to communicate their organization culture. Um, organization culture is very important. It's a, it's a very strong determinant. It correlates very strongly with MPE behavior and satisfaction. Uh, and therefore, it also correlates very strongly with MPE performance and innovation. So if your culture is down the drain in your organization, people are less committed to your organization. They're not willing to share ideas. So making people feel part of your organization is one of the most important things you want to achieve as an organization. Finally, before we go to the organization culture, um, um, sometimes organization cultures tend to fall in line with national cultures, um, which happens. So for example, cultures of organizations in the Netherlands are really fairly, are not really strict. So we are fairly, rather informal um, and, and, and we don't shy to say something to our manager if we disagree. Um, so, it's part of our national culture, but um, it can also be part of our organization culture. But organization culture, of course, can be more than your national culture. So what kind types of organization culture can you have? So in the literature for today, um, there are a couple of chapters. And one of these discusses um, models of management. And this is a way of looking at what management of an organization is. So where as an organization do you, sorry, what as an organization do you focus on? 
So for example, if you look at the bottom right, you see rational goal, and that says to maximization of output. The two dimensions, external and control. How can companies adjust their company culture to, to each country culture? Yeah, that is a very good question. Uh, actually, so uh, let's let's discuss that first. Um, it's quite interesting because that that is um, that is a challenge for many organizations who want to go, you know, international. So, for example, if you are a very Dutch company um, and you want to go abroad, and for example, even if you go to like Belgium, um, your organization culture may not match the national culture. You know, the, our, the directness of the Dutch is really not appreciated in, uh, even in Belgium and not at all in Germany. Um, and there is even a difference between, you know, I'm, I'm from the north of the Netherlands and, and there is a big difference with RC uh, in Brabant, uh, um, which are very less used to the directness. Um, so I don't know how, but you have to. Um, realize that so you have to realize that that maybe in different um, divisions of your organization so if you go abroad and you have a german division or maybe even a japanese division that the culture in that division probably is different from um, the culture in, in the rest of the organization or in another country um, and that's actually one of the main challenges of uh, working together in a larger organization, so for example, in virtual teams. Um, so in virtual teams, people from across the globe like, work together um, for a single organization on a single project. And differences in culture um, is, is one of the main um, uh, focus points there. So if, if that is, if you don't take that into account, um, um, performance of virtual teams will be very low. Um, and it's that's more important than, for example, the actual physical distance of the virtual team. So finally, so it is something you have to take into account. So different parts of the organization have different cultures depending on where they are, um, um, where they are physically, but also where they are in the organization. But exactly how, there's no clear, clear cut answer for that. Very good question. If that is, I hope that's okay. Okay, thanks. Then I go back to this. Um, you may think, what does this has to do with models of uh, models of management? That does has to do with culture. We're getting there. Um, so this model was originally developed as a basic model of management. So what type of manager? what type of organization you are so so how do you want to manage your organization so for example the rational goal that's really a style of management in which you want to maximize output so if you as an organization you know, want to maximize output maximize profits um, then your model of management so your management philosophy is rational goal um, if, you're, if you think your organization should be really innovative, uh, you want to be focused on change, you do want to, you want to uh, do something different every once in a while, your managed style of management or your management philosophy, I think management philosophy is the best word, but your management philosophy in that case is called open systems. But if you want to focus on your human resources, your management philosophy, human relations, and if you want to focus on the internal workings of your organization, your management philosophy is internal process. And the word philosophy means how you should manage the organization. And that is really, really close to the culture of the organization. And so actually a researcher has said, for, well, let's take these basic models of management. So let's take this man these management philosophies and let's see if we can also use them to classify the culture of, of an organization. And that turned out to work pretty well. So this is a well-used um, well framework to classify organization culture. 
Um, there are many more ways. So you can classify an organization according to national culture, for example, power, distance, individualism, um, if we value our free time or whatever. Um, but this one is, is specifically useful because you can really tie it to the structure of the organization and also to innovation. So what does this mean? Well, basically this model says there are two ways, two mental models, two philosophies, uh, two dimensions of philosophy to look at uh, organization culture or to look at management philosophy. Um, the first dimension is flexibility versus control. So some cultures of the organizations are very much geared toward flexibility. So they want to be, you know, uh, they want to be flexible, they want to uh, allow people to, to innovate, to do what they want. And other organization cultures can be more geared towards control. So we want everyone to fall in line, everyone to do what they're told. Um, so those are two management philosophies, but also one dimension of culture. The other one is internal versus external focus. So some organizations may classify their culture in terms of um, external factors. So we are focused on change. We are focused on the consumer. Uh, we value consumer input. We want to do the best for our customers. External focus. Other cultures may be more internally focused. For us, employee development is most important. Uh, we value employees' free time. We want to have a good work-life balance. Internal focus. And that, those are two dimensions. So if you cross these, you have four cells, four typologies of organization culture. So remember, flexibility versus control, internal versus, versus external. And then you get four major classifications of culture. So the first one is rational one. So these organization cultures or these types of organizations focus on the external environment, but are focused on control. Um, so they focus on the markets, they focus on competition, they focus on efficiency. Um, so they focus on efficiency in terms of external requirements. We want to do the best for our customer in the best way to maximize profit or turnover. So they are usually quite goal oriented. So our strategy for the coming years is, is to focus on these external factors. We want to sell more, we want to develop products, um, and we want to achieve that in this and this way. So they are really quite structured as well. So we want to achieve a 10% increase in sales. This is how we're going to do that. So usually they're very competitive. You know, they have a lot of different products. They want to be better than their uh, competitors. So competitiveness and, profit and productivity lead to profitability. So that means that the people who work in the organization are focused on the external environment. How can we get people to buy more of a product? How can we do that most efficiently? How can we um, uh, increase our market share, well, etc.? So you define your success in terms of market share, market penetration, those kinds of things. So think of you know, online marketing agencies, think of organizations in the fast moving consumer goods like Procter & Gamble, Unilever, um, which are really focused on, okay, we want to be the best, make the best products for a huge consumer market. Um, and if you look at their, their culture of the organization, you see that it's really focused on, okay, how can we make our organization profitable? How can we make better products for, for reduced costs, for um, have people buy more? So that's the rational goal. So control, but external. That's why. Uh, the second one is internal process. So this is an organization, a, a type of organization that is focused on internal processes and, and focused on control. Think call centers, think McDonald's. Um, you may think call centers are focused on customers. McDonald's is also focused on customers, but now 
oh, yes, of course, you know, we have customers, uh, you, you need customers, but um, those organizations are really focused on their internal workings. So they want to optimize the internal workings of the organization and, and make sure that their employees can work in the best possible, uh, which is the most efficient way. So they're focused on internal efficiency and stability, um, which you can op obtain through control. So you have a lot of routines, a lot of procedures. Everyone knows they, they are responsible for their part of the job. Um, and usually you have like a, you have like a clear, so you have standardized rules, you have a lot of control and accountability mechanisms. For example, at McDonald's, you can see how long you performed related to other employees. Um, so for example, at commercial call centers, you know, if you have to sell you know, energy contracts, there is usually like a, a screen in the room where you work, where you can see your daily performance compared to the other people around you. Um, so it's really focused on, okay, how on your work and how well you are doing in your organization. So a lot of authority, a lot of standardized rule, um, little autonomy, and you know a lot of rules and policies. So if you want to promote yourself, it really depends on like your knowledge of rules in order to get higher up in the organization. You know, if you work at basic IT, you know network supports. And if you work at a production line in a factory, this is basically your type of organization. That's two. The third one is human relations. Human relations is also internally focused, so focused on internal organization, but is focused on flexibility instead of control. So we're now going over to flexibility. Um, I now realize that I'm making all kinds of movement with, with my hands to indicate the dimensions, but you can't see it. You can only see it now. Stupid. One slide back. Yeah, 10 for effort. <laughs> Zero for uh, accomplishments. <laughs> Unfortunately, in a couple of weeks, uh, you can see my hands. Well, that doesn't sound much, but we see each other in real life. Uh, so human relations. So human relations is focused on the, in the internal organization, but flexible. So this is the type of organization that is focused on the relationships in the organization. So it's informal, focused on interpersonal relationships. We focus on well-being, commitment, participation, support. Um, so your core assumption of your organization is that your employees work best when they work in teams when they, and when they like each other. So you can best manage your organization, you can best manage the entire environment through teamwork, through employee development. Your customers are partners instead of customers. And you want to empower employees. So basically you want to focus on employee commitments and employee satisfaction. And you do that by creating a good internal client. So you have concern for people and you focus on teamwork, on participation, on consensus, those kinds of things. I think our organization is human relations. So we as scientists do not focus that much on our external environment. Okay, we value you as students, but we really consider you part of, uh, really part of what we do at a university and not as really as our customers. Um, and we are really focused on, you know, on, on, on teamwork and on, and on more on like all internal work. So we, we may be mostly human relations or maybe internal process as uh, scientists. But for example, IKEA is a very large corporate program. You know, you're part of the IKEA family and they have all kinds of programs in place for human development at IKEA, uh, for employee development and satisfaction, a lot of attention to work-life balance, those kinds of things. Um, and in general, you also tend to see this kind of culture when 
organizations are not that sensitive to economic cycles because then you don't need to be focused on uh, on your accomplishments and your external environment because that is relatively stable. So insurance agencies, governmental agencies, they are they do fine no matter they do fine no matter what. So they tend to have these types of culture. So then finally, we have the open system. Let me know if I should go back for a while. Uh, the open system is um, also flexible, but then focused on the external environment. So when this is really what you see in those startups, you know, it's, it's a very flexible culture, very cool, very organic, um, but also still very much focused on your customers. So, okay, uh, we are startups and we need to be very attentive to our innovation, very attentive to our, our innovator on people who will, who will adopt our innovation. Um, so this is really entrepreneurial, the startup uh, type of culture. Um, and you see that many larger organizations want to retain this type of culture because they think it's most innovative, you know, like Google, startups, marketing agencies, they want to really have a kind of an open system culture. So this is often tied to a more professional organistic structure of an organization. And this is very decentral, that you need to be innovative, you need to focus on the external environment, you need to be entrepreneurial. Um, this is not to say that innovation always works best in an open system culture. Um, you may think so, and if you have a um, if you have a really uh, innovative product, so your, if your product is really like a, a revolutionary or an architectural innovation, um, then your your culture, then you're probably a startup, and then or or you're probably a specific R and D um, department within a larger organization. Then probably you are open system. But if your innovation is more like incremental or regular. Um, then this may not be best. So because then your innovation may probably be, it may, for example, fit rational goal um, because your innovation is a minor improvement which, um, makes, um, which, which uh, makes you um, reach a new customer group or a minor improvement which makes you sell more for a reduced price, uh, something like that. Um, so it kind of depends on your innovation, on your, on your type of innovation, which type of culture would be best. Also, if you have a very good innovation, uh, which is internally focused, like a process innovation, that may work best in a human relations culture. But it really depends on the characteristics of your innovation, which work best. So don't necessarily think open system is best. Uh, question is if I could go back to internal process, internal process. Um, explain it again. Okay, explain it shortly again. Um, it's also in the literature for today and on the slide and, and, and on the recording. Um, so internal process culture is a culture which is focused on control. So if you work for McDonald's, you still may feel part of McDonald's, but you know that the work you have to do is really uh, control based. So it really fits a mechanistic structure. Um, if you look at the culture of an organization, so how, for example, um, uh, managers communicate to their employees, it's very control based. Okay, you have to do this today. Um, there are very clear lines of decision making. Um, you cannot be very innovative and, and say, well, I don't want, want to do this today, I'm going to do something else, because there is someone who is saying what you are supposed to do. So it's pretty standardized. Um, that also means that you have relatively little autonomy in your organization, uh, in your work. So you have little autonomy to do what you want. Um, therefore, you know, you can feel part of the organization, but not because you feel free. You feel part of the organization because you feel part of the team. You feel part of the organization because you feel proud that you can do the work. Um, so, so that would be the cultural aspects of it. Uh, so that, that is what classifies an internal process. 
Yeah, okay. Thank you. So then, so I hope this, uh, well, as good as you asked the question, is that it's always good to hear that uh, a bunch of times in different forms to remember it best. Um, oh yeah, so I already explained that, that, that it depends on the innovation, which cultural type fit best, um, but it's also the other way around. Um, so the culture also may determine how, and the structure as well, by the way, may also determine how people look to innovation. So what an attitude to innovation is. So people who work in a very internal process organization with a very mechanistic structure may not be the first ones who say, oh, well, let's innovate because it doesn't fit their culture. Also, if you are a rational goal organization, which is very competitive, your culture may be very competitive and people may not be very willing to innovate because they may think for well if, if i have an id i don't want it to get stolen by um, my colleagues because you may see your colleagues as competitors uh, so for example if you if you work in the stock exchange so you work really for yourself and if you have a great idea for an innovation you are definitely not going to tell that to your colleagues and your managers um, because it takes away um, my, it, well, it takes away your profit and your, your income. So um, it depends on, on your organization culture, how people see information. Are you willing to share information or do you think the information belongs to you? Uh, can you use the innovation as a source of power or do you see it as a creativity? So should you share or hoard information? So if you think the information in an organization belongs to the organization, if it is a source of creativity and it should be shared, then you're much more likely to innovate. But if you see innovation that you have as it, belong, as it belonging to you, to be hoarded, to, to be able to yield power in your organization, then your people in your organization are much less likely to innovate. So similarly, so if people are really resistant to change, so for example, in a human relations culture, they may be very much focused on employees, but not very much focused on innovation. They, 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 may, they may consider innovations to be less useful. So different types of innovations belong to different types of culture, but the culture and structure of the innovation also really determines the attitude people have towards, towards sharing information, and towards, toward, towards innovation in general. Ah, two more slides to go. I, oh yeah, well, I probably, I think I already explained this uh, for, uh, uh, to a large extent. So what is here in pink? to stress is that open system is not necessarily the best culture for innovation. Uh, and here I list what type of innovations best fits, fit each culture. Mm -hmm. So open system as said, are more for radical architectural innovations or new type and new markets. Um, so for technologies, which are really at the start of the adoption cycle, at the start of the technology curve, then you need to be, need to be really flexible, really focused on the environment, focused on new technologies. Um, so an open system may best, best fit that kind of innovation. So if you have a revolutionary innovation so, or you have an innovation that's focused on either new technology or new markets, um, but probably especially in new markets, then a rational goal may be better. Um, and, and maybe, you know, if your innovation has, you know, passed the, um, um, the, you know, the, um, uh, the hype cycle, past the gap, then you may say, for, well, okay, we're now in the stage of the early majority, so now it, so that would best fit a rational goal organization. Incremental innovation, probably best with internal process um, and human relations. It, it can be both. You know, it can be that human relations are really focused on themselves and not really on innovativeness. But on the other hand, if you are a human relations culture, you 
people feel part of the team and they also be more inclined to adopt the innovation. So it depends on a bunch of factors um, which innovation will best fit which culture. Would also make for a good exam question, by the way, you know, as an example of an innovation and explain what type of culture would this best fit into. Um, then finally, but I will come back to this uh, when we talk about information systems. Um, that the culture of an organization also affects um, which information technologies work best in your organization. So, for example, we know that social media may make an organization more informal because social media uh, allows you to share information much more easier across the whole organization. Um, but it may also not be. So if you have a very internal process organization or a very rational goal and competitive organization, people may not use social media because they think um, they should keep that information to themselves. So um, also the information systems and the information technology in the organization is also tied to culture. Um, but I will come back to this slide when we talk about information technology in organizations in two weeks, no three weeks, because there's a week in between. Um, so this we get this on the screen over here, uh, we get back to. So for now, I'd say we call it quits. And then uh, I'll see you next week. So next week we we'll talk about technology and processes in an organization. And we talk about how to analyze information in your organization. And I will also think that lecture will take less than one and a half hours. So, um, so thank you very much. And uh, I'll see you next week. Yeah, 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 yeah. I promise it will be a short lecture. Eh? It's still five minutes before the end. Yeah. <laughs> I will never make a promise like that again. So uh, sorry, I talked too much. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.